Lord, let us see your kindness and grant us your salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome, friends. McScruff here. Peace be with you and yours. So earlier this week, we had St. Benedict's Feast Day. He's one of my favorites. He wasn't always, but especially recently, he seemed like he started popping up in random places. And I've been doing more and more research on him. And when I look at today's readings, particularly the Gospel, I notice a reflection of this Gospel in what he did and in what he taught. For those of you who don't know of him, uh, he was an Italian born in Nursia, Italy-ish back in the day, in 480 AD. As a young man, he was a student in Rome, but he was dissatisfied with the often vapid and disquieting manner of the life that he found in Rome. And he retreated away from the city and found a monk in a town some distance from the actual town of Rome. And Benedict was clearly intrigued by the life of this monk that he found. And he became a hermit living in a cave for about three years. And he grew in holiness and in wisdom during that time by gaining control of his passions, by prayer and fasting and contemplation. And eventually the news of his holiness spread and people started coming to him for guidance and for wisdom. And he came out from the cave and began to found monasteries, living under what would eventually be known as the rule of St. Benedict, which laid the foundations for Western monasticism. He was one of the saints that encountered heavy resistance, both in the worldly and spiritual senses. People tried to poison him or otherwise harm him on multiple occasions, but through prayer, he was defended miraculously. I mean, seriously, read up on the stories. Some of them are very crazy. I really started to grow in my appreciation of this saint since I felt something of a connection to him. I think it's easy to look out at the world today and sense a certain ennui in American life nowadays. It seems like waste and like looking for love in all the wrong places are all too common in today's day and age. And I think there's something about the radicality of how Benedict lived that appeals to me and I think appeals to a lot of younger people that I know. When I was discerning the possibility of going to seminary, one of the things that really appealed to me was the prospect of giving up everything, a life that's totally for others. It took me a long time to figure out that if we live marriage authentically, it should be the same should be about giving our lives fully to our husband, wife, and our sons and daughters eventually. It certainly isn't spoken about in these terms these days, but in their different ways, the core of the priesthood and religious life and the married life is very much the same. A person is sanctified by how they give themselves away, how they become more selfless. And both of those paths teach us humility. Unfortunately, it seems like today the church has gotten soft on a lot of things. It may come as a shock to many who view the teachings of the church, particularly in areas of sexuality, to be bronze-aged and overly uptight. But what I mean is, on the whole, there isn't much difference between how the average Catholic lives their life and how a non-Catholic would live their life. Only 20 to 30 percent of Catholics in America attend Mass on a weekly basis. There's widespread confusion on doctrinal issues, even amongst bishops. Contraception happens at about the same rate, and the list could go on and on. And then we see this gospel laid out, where Jesus lays out the conditions of discipleship. When he sends out the disciples, he does so two by two, and specifically instructs them to take nothing with them. Why? Because in order to follow God, we need to be distracted by less. Let's face it, most people don't fall into sin simply to spite God. We fall into sin because something else has our attention, because we put more trust in ourselves that we can climb out of our holes of dissolution and despair and make ourselves happy. We tell ourselves that this thing or this extra drink or more money will satisfy us, when in fact, deep down, I think we know that it really won't. Jesus sends them out two by two that they might be trained to rely only on God. No student is greater than the master. And if we are to have Jesus as our master, we ought to expect that we will need to follow him, living a life that may seem bizarre, foreign, nonsensical. 
These are the conditions of discipleship. Jesus goes so far as to say we will be hated by all because of his name. But he also gives the promise that he will be with us. St. Benedict knew how important it was for us to surrender our lives. The foundation of his rule is humility to the master, and by so doing to encounter God in humility and strive to attain perfection. Any married person, any person in the religious life knows the importance of death to self. It is always a call to give ourselves up, which Jesus does as our master. By following him, we discovered that it's not just giving ourselves up for the beloved, it's giving ourselves to them as well. Here Jesus gives himself totally to us, that we may feed on him in the Eucharist, and that he might be our strength for a journey that's often very difficult. And in the Eucharist, he desires to be so united to us that he would nourish and sustain our bodies and souls with his very self. Let us come to him in quiet, humble confidence of a student before the Master. St. Benedict, pray for us.